Welcome to The Golden Flower. Join Angela Levesque and myself, Gemma Kaufman, as we explore the beauty of living a creative life and dive into the depths of consciousness, the archetypal journey, and the artistic process. Through insightful personal stories and inspiring conversation, we invite you to expand the parameters of your being and trust the aliveness within. This is The Golden Flower, a sanctuary for your creative soul. Welcome to the Golden Flower Podcast, the sanctuary for your creative soul. Today we are talking about ways creatives trap themselves in their own psychology. Uh, I am Angela Levesque. I'm a writer, intuitive coach, and digital artist. And I am Gemma. I'm an artist and creative coach. Well, we have a very interesting topic for you today. As I mentioned, we're going to be talking about the different ways that we trap ourselves in our own psychology as we move through our creative process. Now, that might come as the inner, the voice of the inner critic. It might come as the voice of our parents. It might manifest in a whole number of ways. And so we're going to talk about the ways that we kind of box ourselves in uh, as we work through our creative process and um the ways that we prevent ourselves from really being authentic and vulnerable as we uh, embark on our creative journeys. Uh, Today, I wanted to read uh, a little excerpt from the book, The Creative Act by Rick Rubin. Love, love, love this book. Both Gemma and I are huge fans. Um, We'll probably maybe even do a whole show on some of our favorite pieces from here. But today, I wanted to Uh, share a little excerpt from this book as our creative share. And this is in his chapter. He has little sort of musings, um, little mini chapters on experimentation. Uh, There are countless directions to explore, and we never know which will guide us to a dead end and which will lead us to new realms until we test it. In the case of a song, a vocalist might respond very quickly to a musical track and the melody will immediately reveal itself. Other times, although the singer finds the musical track compelling, they'll listen to it a thousand times and nothing will come from it. In this phase, we're not looking at which iteration progresses the quickest or furthest, but which holds the most promise. We focus on flourishing and wait to prune. We generate possibilities instead of eliminating them. Editing prematurely can close off routes that might lead to a beautiful vista previously unseen. In the experimentation phase, conclusions are stumbled upon. They surprise or challenge us more often than they fulfill our expectations. The heart of experiment is mystery. We cannot predict where a seed will lead or if it will take root. Remain open to the new and unknown. Begin with a question mark and embark on a discover a journey of discovery. Take full advantage of the en- energy inherent in the seed itself and do whatever is possible not to disturb it. You may be tempted to intervene and to steer its development toward a specific goal or preconceived idea. This may not lead to the most productive of its possibilities at this stage of the process. Allow the seed to follow its own path towards the sun. The time to discriminate will come later. For now, allow space for magic to enter. I love that. My favorite, favorite line here is the heart of experiment is mystery. And I... uh, I love this idea because as we talk today about the ways that we kind of trap ourselves, we have to remember that I like the idea of thinking of things as seeds and that we need to like give them the opportunity to, to germinate and, you know, sprout and all of those beautiful things. And if we get too caught up in whether it's that inner critic or some of the other ways that we're going to discuss that we trap ourselves we don't, you know, we kind of stop its growth before it even has the opportunity to get started. What are your thoughts? What are my thoughts? <laughs> it's a wide question. I was thinking there's a lot to take in in that in that reading. Um, yeah, I've, I've got an image in my mind of those dandelions that you blow and all those seeds just take 
flight like my daughter loves them this is they're super magical and I think that's because you experience that metaphor of like look that little seed where is it going to go how many of these will actually um find a place to land and grow and yeah that that passage really talks about the essence of of the creative process um yeah, I was thinking for this episode, I was thinking, you know, what constitutes a trap? You know, <laughs> a basic definition of trap is um, just, I just looked up a very basic uh, definition and it's just a place that is very difficult, if not impossible to escape from. And then because we've brought it in, you know, it's not like a physical trap that we've like fallen into a hole somewhere, uh, but the the idea of the psychology is that this is a trap that we're in. And I think what makes it a trap in the psychological realm is that we don't know <laughs> that we're in the trap a little bit. It's like a, it's invisible to us, you know? And then when I was thinking about this, um, I was also thinking about um, those expressions that come out like being your own worst enemy or could you just get out of your own way <laughs> like as if as if you're just knowingly blocking your own path and that you know that you could just pack up and move and then the way would be clear you know we don't just do that because the whole thing of a psychological trap is in some way we are blocking ourselves we are the source of the obstacle the problem but we don't really know in what way we are it's kind of like a blind spot so well let's let's uh stop right there and then when we get back let's jump into some of these traps that you and I have both come across in our in our own creative journeys all right hello fellow seekers and creators thank you for listening to the golden flower podcast a sanctuary for your creative soul if our podcast has awakened your imagination and you feel the creative impulse stirring, we'd be so grateful if you could leave a review or share an episode with a friend. Who knows, it might just be the spark they've been waiting for. And for those of you who want to go deeper, join the conversation. Share your reflections, dreams, and creations with us using hashtag Golden Flower Podcast on Instagram. Your thoughts and projects matter. Let's play with the possibilities. Your creative life is calling. All right. Well, as I mentioned before the break, we are talking about the ways that we, as creatives, trap ourselves in our own psychology. So, Gemma, I'm going to let you start us off on this conversation. Which way to go? Well we, well, we mentioned briefly like a trap in this context being like, how have you ever had someone say to you, could you just get out of your own way? Have you ever <laughs> experienced that? Uh, I'm not sure that somebody's ever specifically said that to me, but I, mm -hmm. I can appreciate the sentiment. And for sure, uh, there's ways that I, that I trap myself. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we're going to hear some of them. Yeah, I mean, there's so many ways that we trap ourselves. And one of the main ways I trap myself is to overcomplicate things and have 10 options when they, there could be one. So I'm trying not to do that in this episode. And just, you know, the one, I mean, I was thinking about the seeds floating that kind of naturally segues into something we've discussed called uprooting, right? <laughs> Which is not letting the seed, the miracle of that seed, actually finding a space to land and having a place to, to turn into something. So that's, so I, I feel like uprooting is like something went out, we shared something and then we kind of pull it back. I do a lot of this self censoring, um, judging something, pulling it back before, uh, but also stopping things before I've had a chance to grow from the experience like just not seeing things through which is why it's so important to you know we've done we've created accountability with this podcast to make sure that we give it a chance to kind of 
let it be a journey. Let it be a learning uh, journey. It's very easy to um, stop doing something before it has a chance to kind of show what it could be. And it's really sad how we do that. And it's something that's so prevalent. So I would say in summary, like one of the traps is a form of self-rejection, which is when we delete, censor, pull back on something before it's had an opportunity to turn into whatever it is. Um, I'm we've talked so about- I'm so glad you mentioned uprooting because that is a classical trap of mine. But mm-hmm. I have a slightly different view of it. Like mm-hmm. for me, uprooting, I fall in love with the aliveness, like how fun it is to when you have that seed and you get to play with it and you're like, oh, this is awesome. Like, for example, building, I love building websites. And so it's so fun. I've, (laughs) I've redone my website so many times because I fall in love with that aliveness at the beginning. And then what happens, and perhaps, you know, it could fall in the realm of self-censorship or self-rejection. But to me, it's like, where I get stuck is that following through of the consistency. So I love the beginning of projects because they have so much energy and you really get to like play with the creativity. You have all these ideas and you're pulling from here and all this beautiful stuff is coming in inside. And, and, and then when it's like, okay, now I've really got something and then you have to carry it into that next phase and maybe we should do our next show on the creative process. It's usually that next phase where, uh, like Rick Rubin said, don't prune yet, don't prune yet. It's when I start to get to the pruning phase that all of a sudden things start to feel more like work, feel more mm-hmm. tedious, and I lose some of that aliveness. And then something over here is like, oh, wow, there's that spark over here. And then I jump over to that spark. And meanwhile, this this thing that is just, you know, maybe started to sprout, I just kind of let it wither and die and follow the next thing that feels alive. And so I think those are two examples of uprooting, but perhaps have a different um, psychology behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the seeing it throughness that's, that's just really tough, like that word consistency that shows up so often, which leads me to another trap and again this one is uh it was it's a pattern that I noticed I think it was like in the first year of coaching a lot of different people that they would just come up so often around the question of what do you think it is holding you back like when you're kind of gathering information of like you know where someone's at and it's very often the reply to the what's holding you back or what do you think is holding you back would come with a reply with the preface, is that how you say it? Like, come with the sentence, oh, I just need to, duh, 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 duh. Um, <laughs> I was like, okay, how many, um, how many of those can I remember? Like, I just need to, these are from real conversations, have more energy. I just need to get really good at what I'm doing. I just need to have more money. I just need to wait a few more years. I just need to have more space. I just need to work harder. Uh, I just need to do more research. Like there's so many, but like they were the ones that I got to. Do you recognize any? <laughs> <laughs> yes. People listening. Yeah. And you know, this, this is quite a good example of a trap. If we're going with that idea that it's a trap because we don't really spot it as a trap because on the surface you know we say those kind of things often to ourselves like when we're talking to ourselves self-coaching the beauty of saying it to someone else I'll get to that in a minute but the you're kind of saying look I recognize that x is an issue I need more time or you know I need I just need to get well I just need to do these things and then you know, that's, but what, what happens there is we create a condition. It's like, we don't really realize that we're doing it. So the conditions are, I can't have the solution until I do this thing that I've identified as a block. But then we get kind of stuck there. It seems like it's 
taking responsibility, like, okay, I'm aware there's a problem. This is the problem. But in a way, it puts the power on on the problem because we're basically agreeing that we're we're in a we're basically saying, okay, until I have more space, more time, more energy, more money, I can't have the sales, the I don't know that the next level, whatever it is that we were trying to get to, in whatever way we were trying to be better, is not going to be available until this thing. Um. And it just doesn't lead to inspired action. It's a, it's a classic example of a habitual mental loop. And in my experience, the only thing that really interrupts that loop and that thinking is that if you say, if you tell that story, because it is a story, it's a story that we collude with ourselves like, yeah, that's right. I just need, you know, if I had more time, if I just had more time, then then I'd be able to get all this work done or, you know, whatever it is. But when you tell it to someone who's a active listener, who's actively listening, like, you know, we're, we're trained as coaches to, to smoke out these kind of very vague intentions, these unmeasurable outcomes. Because um, it's only then when someone will say something like, well, how will you know, like, when will you know that you've worked harder or when, how much space, you know, all those clarification questions, they don't come in really when we're just running those loops on our own they come out during a conversation like a a conversation where someone's really listening they don't have to be a trained coach but they have to be really listening if they're not they're just going to be like yeah yeah and probably tell you their version of what they just need to do to get what they want kind of thing I think this is a really good example of an insidious trap and we all have versions of that and I know many people who are incredible coaches who will still fall into the trap of making a sentence like that often when they're tired depleted overwhelmed or whatever um it's just I don't I was I was like what is this about is it it's it's like it's like the carrot you can have x when you do blah blah is that the conditioning is that because of how we're raised as children I don't know that's pure speculation but I would say if you want to look out for one of the most common uh, psychological traps that we do to ourselves it's a sentence that goes somewhere along the lines of when we're trying to think of what's holding us back I just need to fill the gap yes I see that I've seen that so many times in you know coach uh if I just had yes more money more time I I find often that it comes down to, um, I just need more training or education or, you know, like, because if you think about uh, the imposter syndrome, right? And people will be like, who am I to write this book? Who am I to call myself an artist? Who am I, you know what I mean? It's that idea of, I just, if I had a little bit more expertise, or if I had a little bit more training or a little bit more education, then it would be okay for me to to put this out there and having interviewed myself about well over 300 people I can (laughs) tell you that uh of from all different people who are you know New York Times bestsellers multiple times over to people like self-publishing uh their first book it's just something that you just you have to recognize in yourself and um and work through that. And it's not, it doesn't, like you said, it's not about having the right amount of money or the right amount of time or the right amount of energy. Those are all just ways that we try and prevent ourselves from, I think, stepping into what I would call like our big self. And uh, so that's a very insidious trap. Another one that I think is um, especially uh, important at the beginning of the process is when people opt for perfection over exploration. So even something as simple as like you, you're wanting to write something down, say you're going to write an article and you start writing and you're, you get caught up on all your typos and, you know, your grammar mistakes. And then you're like, oh, well, that doesn't really, you know, just at, especially at the beginning in that when you're still playing with the mystery and you're not wanting to start pruning things, you just have to allow yourself to just, you know, put pen to paper or put brush to canvas and just see where it goes. Like be in 
uh, like in a dance with, with that mystery and just allow it to come out. And what I love about that, there's been so many times when I saw, started to like write an article and then I just allow myself to just keep writing. And I realize that I'm actually writing a different article than the one I sent out, like with, you know, sitting down to write. And I realized like, you got to let yourself you got to let yourself play with that. So especially in the beginning, just value exploration over perfectionism. I like it. I feel like I might fall into a category the other end of the spectrum that that's all I do sometimes is <laughs> I go with it, see where it goes. And I trap myself. I need to have the discipline to go back and do the pruning and do the, do the refinement and, um, remember sometimes the the focus and and the point so I think it does come down a little bit to knowing you know which way you lean do you tend I you know I don't really have a problem with self-censoring when it comes to like you know writing versus vast quantities for example but I know a lot of people do and that's the point that you're making it's like nothing's gonna you're not gonna have anything to work with if you don't just let it go if you don't be in that place of experimentation and possibility and everything that the Rick Rubin quote was kind of illustrating there that there's there's got to be this kind of discovery element going on um and it takes a bit of practice if if that's difficult for you it's going to take a bit of uh I don't know where it is holding he, another thing that he talks about in this book is about the rules. And I mm. find that people get really um, caught up in the rules of things. So even, for example, say I'm leading somebody through like an exploratory guided meditation where we're really just really we're wanting um, to kind of get what's in the inside, like what's in our subconscious mind to like come out and mm you know, say I'll be leading them and, you know, you're going across a field and you see a cabin, but that person in their mind doesn't see a cabin. They see a giant oak tree, but they're so worried about seeing the cabin that then all of a sudden, instead of going with that oak tree, they're like, oh, no, no, no. Okay. They're they're like going into this really like kind of forceful position of like, I need to see this cabin. And you're like, no, but what's being revealed is the oak tree. You got to be able to go with that. But people... Um, I think another trap is they get caught up in the rules. Like, no, it, it's supposed to be this way. And, um, you know, if I'm writing, I have to follow all the conventions. If I'm writing a, a screenplay, I have to follow. And I think there's something to be said for understanding the rules, but there's something to be said for just allowing yourself to just, just go and, mm-hmm. and go with what's presented versus trying to make it form, you know, fit into a form of some idea that you have in your head. And I think that that's, that's a, that at least for myself, that's a, it can be a common trap as well. And that I see with my clients all the time. Yeah. I mean, isn't it so much that often creative people are making the leap towards a more creative life precisely because they don't want to follow the rules because they don't want to be um following such a rigidity or <laughs> can't say the word um rigidity rigidity <laughs> um but i think one of the biggest traps is feeling trapped by <laughs> you know you can just it takes a huge leap to kind of rearrange your life to kind of prioritize the creative life or make make the reach for being a creative professional in some way and then it, I mean it's such a big topic to, to, to talk about but you know it's very rare to talk to someone who's made that decision to bring bring their creativity to the center of their existence and not be feeling the pressure in some way about how to make that work if you're an individual working alone if you're also working other jobs just to support things and this, I don't know, I would kind of, it wasn't really the point that you were making, but you know, I was just like, when you were talking about breaking the rules and I was thinking, oh, that's one of the big pulls that 
pulls the creative towards um, certain professions and certain, you know, a certain lifestyle and whatever is just this strong desire for flow. I think that was what got me is to say, you were talking about flow and how important it is. And there's so many people like, yes, I want that flow. I want that to be the way that, you know, to have that (laughs) and not be so constrained. And then very quickly we discover, actually, I'm working way harder. I'm working way harder and I'm not getting paid and all these kind of things. But again, it's a really, it's, it's, it's too big to kind of use flippant examples, you know, because there's, there's plenty of very good real life examples that we can go into proper detail and really, and really flesh out that, that trap of, you know, I jumped out of that trap <laughs> because I, I didn't feel enough freedom and I've jumped into this trap and in many ways I have less freedom I mean I could say I know both of those and I kind of prefer the one that feels like oh what's coming to mind is with when you feel trapped pursuing your creative endeavors you can I almost know that I've kind of got addicted at some points to the possibility that I can (laughs) note the sentence I can just (laughs) I could, I just need to, <laughs> and I'll get out of this trap. I just need to, blah, blah. So this feels like when you're in a trap of your own choosing, like that you have way more potential to get out of it if you could just crack the code, crack the equation, just have more X, Y, Z. The little, it kind of takes us full circle. <laughs> well, I like what you said about people who are attracted to the creative life are looking for more flow. And, and that's something that I see a lot with like the demographics that I coach is there's, they feel overwhelmingly burdened by a sense of conformity. So they may Mm -hmm. like to introduce more creativity into life. And that might even just be like dressing a little bit more like flowy, a little bit more colorful. Um, And some of that is, incredibly hard for people (laughs) to even just you know when we think about not just being an artist but just being more creative in your life like um expressing that through maybe interesting makeup or you know adornment the way that you wear you know jewelry or or like I said colorful clothing um but it isn't the colorful clothing or the jewelry it's whoever it is who's choosing that feels like they've become they're expressing more of themselves you know so some people it's the opposite some people it's that or sometimes it's getting more minimal or stylish in some particular kind of way but whatever it is it's that confidence to be like actually I'm choosing this because I know it's more me and I want to express that and let and let that be known and seen and it's very big I agree not that it's a big step for a lot of people it is and it goes back to the I think episode one where we talked about creativity is an act of rebellion Mm -hmm. Um, Because I think a lot of people, especially as you get older and, you know, you have, uh, you know, public personas or you're the, you know, uh, the leader at the school or whatever, and they feel a sense of being confined and not being able to really kind of put out maybe a little bit more of their, (laughs) their um, sassiness or creativity or whatever it is. And uh, I think breaking out of that is not only, I think, freeing from a creativity perspective, but just from being living more authentically in your life. I work a lot with women who are in their like early, later 40s, and they're like, okay, I've kind of raised my kids. I've reached a certain level of um, success in my work. And now I want to explore these parts of myself. And yet when I look around that feels very scary. It feels very difficult to kind of step into that when that's not something that I have been, you know, embodying up until this point. And I think it's so important though. It's so important. I mean, I think there's definitely a correlation between, because I'm thinking about people that I've worked with who don't, wouldn't at all describe themselves as artists or even creatives, like, you know, working in, corporate realm for example um but like you say wanting to reclaim a a part of themselves and uh like 
exploring some painting, for example, just, you know, we've never spoken in those sessions directly about self-image or, you know, wanting to express differently in life, but just through engaging in something like paintings and having an experience of that flow state just has a direct knock-on effect that I noticed there is a subtle, sometimes not so subtle change in someone's appearance. You know, there's not, they haven't consciously made that, but there's something that happens that they, they've re-remembered that there's a part of them that can, uh, work more in the present moment and, and get into those, in, into those flow states. I mean, I was, ref I was, when, when we use the word flow, I really realized that it has a big charge for me and as part of like really the core desires of what I, you know, I've, I've, I talk about it, but painting all the time, but not just in painting in life. Like I, I, I guess, cause I'm being highly intuitive and being in that category like I really really enjoy that effortless it's almost like an elegant feeling when things just flow I love it and I find it really like we was it last episode when we talked about different states of consciousness like being above or below the line like what below the line is life is happening to me and above the line is life is happening for me and I feel like the flow state really has this like oh this 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 sense of everything being workable and moving and leading to the next thing and people coming at the right time and working with your in, in, intuition and just being knowing like okay no don't feel that one but yes feel that one and it's it's such an enjoyable way of being huh yes <laughs> of course <laughs> true, to, true to form taking us somewhere else <laughs> you had a point that you wanted to make about surrender that I thought was really interesting are you ready to go there I think I was I was musing on how surrender is such an important part of the creative process, but like everything, it has its, its, its shadow. And I think I was just considering when is something a surrender and when does something become passive and when does a more pure form of surrender become um, escaping out of taking action because you're just kind of surrendered into this it's all happening I don't really need to do too much it's it's a very it's a very delicate thing yeah if you talk about flow you talk about surrender but you know we do need to take action I just know that I know in one one way really works for me and I know that sometimes when I get really like right I'm taking charge of things I'm gonna firm this agreement up and did I don't know if it must be the energy that I put behind that but it it rarely goes as well <laughs> you know so, like I create the obstacle I get all like right I need to firm this up <laughs> um there's a line between being passive and going going with the flow and mm -hmm. I think going with the flow is quite an active dynamic state right versus when you're passive and you're just kind of like waiting for things to come to you. And I think that there's a difference there. And that's actually another trap I wanted to talk about, um, especially because, you know, I come from a, a more like spiritual community, that idea of you are almost talking about spiritual bypassing, like where mm -hmm. you go um, kind of directly to the love and light without actually processing things. Like I have a lot of people in my life that are like, no, I don't, I don't watch the news. I don't pay attention to anything. I have to make sure that everything stays high vibe and we got to, you know, just keep, keep our eyes just really focused up here. And I think from a, a creative perspective, also from, I think a, a healthy mental health perspective, sometimes we have to not sometimes we have to allow some of that yuckiness, even if it's not beautiful, you know, even if it doesn't, you know, look aesthetically pleasing or it doesn't sound aesthetically pleasing to the ear, like sometimes we've got to wrestle with some of that darker stuff because it doesn't just go away, right? And so I think what happens then is we kind of just, you know, we swim in the shallow end of the pool, and that doesn't produce, it doesn't produce good art, I don't think. I don't think it produces a good life. Um, 
if we're just kind of not paying attention to some of the the murkier stuff. And I think that that's where we have the opportunity to kind of work through that. So if we're always just like, no, we got to keep it light. We got to keep everything as high vibrational as possible. Um, well, that might create beauty. It doesn't create a lot of substance and authenticity and vulnerability. And sometimes we have to jump into the the, sh- the deep end of the pool kind of to get to the heart, to the essence of things. And so I've seen that trap over and over again uh, in in my community. If it doesn't feel good, <laughs> I don't do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And let's face it, sometimes art is is dark and messy and, you know, uh, uh, Chuck Palahniuk, who wrote, is that his name? Uh, Chuck Pal- yeah. 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 Who wrote uh, Fight Club and I've read a few of my other, his stuff, he's such Monster. a great writer. Monster. But, yes. But he is so willing to jump into the, the deep end of the pool and to explore some of the harder things. And I think sometimes as creatives, we need to be willing and able to do that sometimes for our own sanity, but sometimes to produce some of the great work because it's not all, you know. Honestly, if if I hear the expression high vibes or if I see it, I just run in the opposite direction. Just, <laughs> it's like the word smart, <laughs> smart meter, smart ball, run. Smart and I think run, high vibes, run. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> All right. Well, after this short break, we will uh, jump into our creative challenge for this episode. Hello, fellow seekers and creators. Thank you for listening to the Golden Flower Podcast, a sanctuary for your creative soul. If our podcast has awakened your imagination and you feel the creative impulse stirring, we'd be so grateful if you could leave a review or share an episode with a friend. Who knows, it might just be the spark they've been waiting for. And for those of you who want to go deeper, join the conversation. Share your reflections, dreams, and creations with us using hashtag Golden Flower Podcast on Instagram. Your thoughts and projects matter. Let's play with the possibilities. Your creative life is calling. All right. Well, it's we've been a few weeks since we've done a podcast. And the last creative challenge we ended on was journaling on the idea, is your dream still your dream? This sent me into a tailspin. <laughs> It was interesting. So I I started journaling and I decided actually to go way back and kind of like look at chunks of my life um, and think about, you know, like up until I was 18, what was my dream? And then 18 to like 28, what was my dream? And 28 to 38, what was my dream? And now, you know, I'm 46 and looked at, I looked at like, what were the common themes between them? Um, what was going on in my life that was really like supporting that dream. And I realized that indeed my dream is not, it was no longer my dream that, and this is kind of why I feel like I've been kind of floating the last few years is because I've been half-hearted because I've been pursuing something that was no longer in resonance for who I am. So it was a really, really powerful uh, exercise for me to do. And kind of why we haven't done us, <laughs> not because of this show, but both you and I kind of had a little, we were spun out a little mm-hmm. bit from, from that exercise. A little breakdown. <laughs> a little mini breakdown. Well, wait, tell, tell me a little bit about what happened for you with going through that. I can't. It's, it's too close to her, too close. I'm someone that I mean, you know, I had a existential crisis, of course. I mean, I've had so many. <laughs> I should be good at them by now. And it's honestly, you're going to have to ask me in like a couple of weeks. Just be, don't okay. let me, I just can't formulate it. I don't, I don't have that capacity yet. All I know is that I'm starting to feel clearer, but I haven't got enough distance to tell you what went on. But yeah, it was powerful. <laughs> yes. And it's, yeah, I'm still working out the details. And, uh, but, you know, to speak to what we were talking about today, just I've seen a lot of the traps that we talked about show up. Um, 
in the last few weeks. And it's been uh, it's been a wild ride. Actually, since we started the show, it's been quite a destabilizing <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> event in my life, which is okay. I'm up for I'm up for that. Well, today we thought it would be interesting to do another journaling exercise um, about this idea of planting seeds. So at the beginning, I I read that little excerpt from Rick Rubin, and he's talking about like don't prune too early, just play with the seeds, play with the mystery. Um, so. Yeah, write down everything that feels alive for you right now, right now. And this could be words, phrases, like anything. Just allow whatever seeds, it's springtime, right? This is the time of uprising energy. This is the time, like literally I was planting my garden last on, on Mother's Day this past weekend. So play with these ideas. Write down all of these seeds. Write down everything that feels juicy and alive and nurturing. And then pick one of these seeds and play with the biggest version of that idea. So what would it look like in your grandest version of this? Again, this doesn't have to be the one, just like his excerpt, it doesn't have to be the one that you follow through on, but just the the exercise of like opening up that box and just playing with it. And Gemma had another kind of, uh, another thing to journal on within this challenge in case you get caught up in your traps. And so Gemma, I wanted you to uh, explain that. Well, I, we just can't get enough of these destabilizing exercises. <laughs> I can do some more journaling. <laughs> What's going to happen this time? Um, well, I like I liked yours. It seemed I liked your challenge because it seemed a bit more playful. Um, just to recap, like seeds are just like little bits of ideas that are like bits of inspiration that are that are alive for you right now and 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 then and then letting them imagine imagining them taking form in in the most expressed way kind of thing okay and then when you're in that expanded place of possibility ask yourself what's stopping you and then you could journal with that or powerful sentence uh make that little template i just need to and then this is a clearing exercise this is like making conscious all the unconscious agreements that you've made and i'm telling you if you have answers to that question and you will you'll have a shit ton of them these are all agreements running in your unconscious and it's really good to get an audit of them so the example might be Okay, so you've just gone, okay, I could create this thing. Well, what's what's holding you back? And then use the template as if you as if you're being asked that question. And then your template would be, I just need to like, or what do you need to do? I just need to. Maybe it's better. What do you need to do? I just need more money. I just need yeah. <laughs> more time. I just need time is going to be. I would suggest doing that after you've played with the grandest version mm -hmm. of what that looks like. Like I've had this thing in my life that keeps dropping in. It's like the only thing that has been cons consistently dropping in that I haven't like jumped on. Um, so for example, like way back in 2010 or 2012, whenever it was, and it dropped in that I was going to do a radio show and I followed through and that was amazing. And I've had this idea come in and it keeps coming in and I keep ignoring it. And that's not what I normally do. So I'm going to play with that as first with my grandest idea, my grandest vision. What would it look like if I blew open all the, I blew open that box that I've trapped mm -hmm. myself in? And then I'm going to play with your question because mm -hmm. something, the fact that I didn't jump on it and it's been showing up in my consciousness for uh almost two years at this point I've got a I've got some exploring to do so I'm going to play with that and we'll see where where that takes me I'm so curious what is this do I know <laughs> uh I'm not sure that we've ever talked about it even more curious <laughs> so maybe okay. we'll pick that up next week after I've done a, a little bit more exploring Mm -hmm. Okay, and we'll, we'll write the details as usual. 
We and invite you to um, play with this idea of planting seeds, write down everything that feels alive for you right now. If you'd like to share um, what's going on, we still have our Instagram. We'll, we're still playing with that idea. Gemma and I both have a really hard time with Instagram. I just... I think we've got... Oh, haven't we kind of got to the point? Or I'm I'm pushing for closure. <laughs> But for now, we still have it. So you can follow us on Instagram at Golden Flower Podcast. You can find us on YouTube at The Golden Flower. If you'd like to learn more about Gemma, you can go to GemmaKaufman.com. If you'd like to know more about myself, you can go to go ChaosAndLight.com. Yeah. I'm sorry. I feel like say I, that again? I feel like I want to do yours. You can go to ChaosAndLight.com, which I want to say is a tremendous resource. Not all websites have the level of, you know, discoverable amazing articles that you have it's a resource you know there's websites okay they're nice and then there's like ones like yours which are you know you heard Angela likes to redesign and redesign it's beautiful it's a beautiful place to hang out I recommend well thank you Gemma that's very nice of you to say anyway uh thanks for listening today follow the aliveness nurture that spark and we will see you next week bye